Would I say my shoe is full of swag? Honestly, yes, because I use swag unironically. One thing about me, if my outfit looks fire, I'ma tell you I'm swagging from head to toe. Head to toe, I'm really corny, I'm not gonna lie. I have no shame in that, like, I'm funny. It's what I do, but like not intentionally. It's just people don't take me seriously sometimes. Like I really do mean I have swag. Like I love I love the early two thousands um, slang. Like I love the music from that time. So I like using words like swag. Um, I don't I don't know. It's like drip is cool. But like, I'm also concerned there might be a mess in the impending future. You know what I'm saying? I don't trust, I don't trust drip. Drip leads to water damage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you, you, no, because you can't, you can't, drip, drip will only get you so far. But swag, I dropped the microphone, oh my gosh. Swag though, swag will take you places. water and then erase with the white side of the sponge i'm gonna be so bad if i drop it in the water okay it's in the water sweat what are the name of the sneakers mm -hmm. the name of the sneakers are fila disruptors twos i believe can't remember the number but they're definitely fila disruptors um, yeah. So what makes a Fila Disruptor a Fila Disruptor? Um, it's the name of the shoe, the style of the shoe. These are a chunky sneaker. They have these, of course the Fila, but it's the way it's laced up. I don't know how to explain it. It's just, I really like it because it's a chunky shoe and then they just come in so many colors. Like, I started with the white ones just to see if I would like the shoe, but my plan is to get peach. They have a really bright yellow one, a nice soft blue one, different kinds. Why am I a fan of a white shoe? I'm a fan of a white shoe because they're a very neutral color. They go with everything. Um, you got an all black outfit, wear a white shoe. All pink outfit, wear a white shoe. You wanna wear some blue, wear a white shoe. You feeling earthy, wanna wear some browns, wear a white shoe. You can't go wrong. Can't go wrong with a white shoe. Am I a fan of chunky sneakers? Yes, indeed. I love a big shoe. Um, I would describe my fashion style as a very streetwear. Really, I just like to dress comfy, so I like baggy pants, I like loose shirts, and nothing complements it better than a chunky sneaker because it's comfortable, versatile, and just, it makes my outfit look good too. Is this my dream pair of sneakers? Yes, this is indeed my dream pair of sneakers. Um, I found these a couple years ago, like right, I think right when the pandemic started, I had been looking for a new shoe to kind of go with my outfits that would be comfortable and still um, look nice. And I had started wearing platforms like the year before or a couple years before. So this was a perfect little balance because it wasn't an unreasonable height to be walking around with. And because it's a sneaker, it's kind of designed to be walked in. So it's very comfortable and I could wear it to work. I could wear it to hang out with some friends. I could wear it to a concert and I'm very comfortable. Plus, I like that the brand or this line specifically comes in so many colors because I start with the white. But when I get a different color, I can just um, add it to the collection and keep bossing up my fits. To sound a little corny, I'm not gonna lie. This is actual magic, oh my goodness. Do I like the additional height that the sneaker gives me? Yes, because it's very subtle. I'm 5'6", which isn't short, but I have a lot of tall family members. So 
my favorite thing to do is wear something that will subtly increase my height because they're not going to notice how significantly shorter I am than them. Plus, at work, I work with a lot of tall people and I don't like feeling small sometimes because some of them be a little uh, weird. So um, I like that it adds a little bit of height because it makes it so I feel a little more comfortable just like in my space. What does it mean to hold secrets as a hairdresser? Um, for me, it means just whenever my client tells me something, it doesn't leave that interaction in the salon. Sometimes my clients come to me about like stuff they're nervous about, about relationship issues, and it's stuff they're not ready to tell their friends just yet. So they kind of want a judgment-free space where there's a lack of involvement so they can get an unbiased opinion. And for me, I appreciate that because I like being able to provide that safe space for them where they know they can talk about something and it's not going to be met with judgment or aggression. Unless they have a problematic view, I'm not going to lie. Because sometimes my clients do say things in, in a way that's uh, not politically correct. And, you know, I got to let them know, hey, can't talk to people like that. They're like, what do you mean? And I'm just like, you got to explain that, you know, sometimes... It's not what you say, it's how you say it, and that's why you might be having such a negative response. Is there a certain amount of pressure when people treat their hairdresser as their therapist? I think it's very dependent on how the hairdresser and the client interact. Like, whenever I talk to my clients, I personally let them know, like, hey, I don't know you, I don't know them, I don't know the situation entirely, I just know what you're telling me. And take what I say with a grain of salt, because quite frankly, I know how I think and how I handle situations, and we're not the same person, and that's okay. Because a lot of people forget that if there's so many different types of people in the world that you don't have to try to be one type of person. It's like, be yourself and handle it how you feel works for your situation. Some people are able to forgive things that other people view as unforgivable. And it's very important to take that into account when handling situations. So I like to let them know, like, you know, you're coming to me, but I'm not a trained professional in therapy. And I definitely don't know the other person, what they're going through. So always remember to take everything I say with like a handful of salt, not even just a grain, because I only have one side of the story. The difference on this is insane. I don't even know if I'm doing a good job, but I can see a significant difference and I love it here. What makes a dream sneaker a dream sneaker? For me personally, a dream sneaker is something that checks all the boxes. I want versatility and I want comfort, but I also want style. I want something I can wear to the club, that I can wear to a sports game, that I can wear to a concert, I can wear to work. It's just something I can always rely on. My old, old faithful, I like to call them. It's just, if I have nothing else to wear, I can always wear this and I know it'll look good. So for me, a dream sneaker is just being able to have that. Does this dream sneaker remind me of my old dream sneaker? Funnily enough, yes. I wasn't really like a doll kid, but I did get Barbies as a gift growing up and I got Bratz dolls and I definitely preferred the Bratz because I liked that they had the platforms, the chunky shoes, like even how I ended up dyeing my hair when I got older with the blonde streaks. I got it from a Bratz doll when I was younger. So it's kind of like another fulfillment from like healing my inner child and doing things that I didn't get to do when I was little. My mom wouldn't buy me chunky shoes because we had to go with what was practical. And realistically, I was too much of a roughhouser to attempt to walk in some platform anything. What does it mean to heal your inner child? For me, it's doing things that I wanted to do when I was younger. Just to say I did it. Sometimes it's like trying a food just to see if I like it. Other times it's like doing an activity that I can do now that I couldn't do when I was younger because 
we didn't have the money, the time, the um, resources. It's, um, I'm the second of five children and we're all close in age. We were born between 98 and 2010 was when the youngest was born. So we're all like only a couple years apart. <clears throat> so my mom always had to take everybody into account when it came to what we were buying and what we were doing. So I had to sacrifice a couple of wants, which of course I could recognize were wants for the sake of like making sure everybody had and nobody asked me to do it. It was just something that like I didn't mind doing because I knew once I was older, the first thing I was gonna do was do everything that I couldn't do when I was younger. So I got my septum pierced and I dyed my hair and I got my car and I'm learning to roller skate and I'm gonna learn how to swim because my mom was really scared of water. She didn't want us to drown. So she would never let us go to the pool. So by the time she took us to get lessons, it was like, she signed us up for like a five-year-old class. And we just, we weren't able to really learn because they were focused on the smaller children. So it's like, I can paddle a little bit, but I'm not gonna be on a cruise ship anytime soon because without a floaty, I'm done for. Is it important to read? It is important to read because it avoids a lot of confusion and it also saves a lot of time. Sometimes you waste time by asking questions that you could have found out had you just taken the time to read. Like, um, toe signs. Read them carefully because, you know, it's like you can park your car somewhere and it says, you know, you can park here but only two hours. If you park there for three hours and you're confused as to why your car was ticketed or towed, it's because you didn't read. That, that's on you, my guy. But also it's like if somebody tells you, hey, love you so much, you know, we really have had a great thing going on, but I'm in a place in my life where I think I should just be single, I need to focus on myself, and I think it's time for me to move on, go our separate ways, and so I'm moving out, and um, I love you, but you know, we can't be together anymore, you know what I'm saying? But they'll only read the wow, I love you, and I'm so happy we've been together. And they're like, wow, babe, I love you so much too, I can't wait to see you when I get home, and you're just like, oh. Not that that's a real moment, but like in a hypothetical situation, it's like, I can't put the exact situation in which the text was right because it was not so wholesome and heartbreaking. It was so heartbreaking, but it wasn't so wholesome. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. It's a lot. It's like, you can't send people paragraphs either. Mm -hmm. You have to send them like sentence at a time because yeah. they're not gonna read big blocks of text. <laughs> Is it the parent's responsibility to help you and heal the inner child? <clears throat> Sorry. Is it the parent's responsibility to help you heal the inner child or is it your responsibility to heal your inner child? I think it is only your parent's responsibility if they want it to be and if you want them to be a part of it. it everything's a two-way street and that's what a lot of people fail to for, uh, remember. It's like, I can say what I want from somebody but if they can't give me that for whatever reason, they're not going to. You know what I'm saying? It's not even just because they want to. They might just not be in a situation where they can. They might not be mentally able. They might not be physically able, financially able, whatever the reason. But it's like, if I'm asking them for something that they can't give me, they won't be able to give that to me. And it's like, it's on me to communicate that I need that, need that from them if I want that from them. But it's on them to decide if that's something they can or will give me. Like, with my parents specifically, it's like, my dad is just really stubborn and hard-headed and he loves to play victim. It's like, he, but he's an antagonist. It's like, it's my favorite thing about him. He loves, why do I admire antagonists? I admire antagonists because they have this special talent for being able to find exactly what will get people riled up and they know how to focus it in a way that gets, that elicits a response that they want. It's in a way, it's like, it's like a kind of distant fascination, like from a psychological standpoint, like they know how to manipulate in a way that elicits the response that they want. And it's interesting to see how they do it. Like my dad specifically will, um, he likes, it's like if you're yelling in his mind, he's no longer the problem. It's so funny, it's so funny, but it's like, if you're the one yelling, it's like, bro, you look crazy right now. What are you even screaming for? 
We were just having a conversation. <laughs> it's like, it works with my brother specifically because he has, he has a quick temper. Love him to pieces. But um, it's just, it's like, it's funny, but fascinating because it's like, I don't know how to explain it other than it's like, they're master manipulators is the best way to explain it. And it's just like, from a psychological standpoint, it's like, how are they able to figure it out and pinpoint it and hone in on it and make it work to their advantage, you know? If there's one thing I am, it is a problem. <laughs> Ooh. These shoes really been through it. Okay, old faithfuls. Do I expect my dream shoes to take me where I need to go in life? Yes. I feel like one thing that always causes people to um, move forward is lack of comfort. When people aren't comfortable, they have to change something. Like, when you get too comfortable, that's when you get too focused on, um, like, following the routine, stuck in the monotony. But with shoes, it's like, you can wear them, you can love them, you can take good care of them, but after a while, you gotta replace them. And <laughs> after a while, you gotta replace them. And realistically, it's like, the shoes will take you as far as they can, but when it's time to replace them, you know it's time to move on. So you always know when it's time to take another step. Did I answer the question? Okay. How much longer do I think my dream shoes will last? I'm not gonna lie, there's a little bit of wear on this side right here, and it's like no longer white at all. Like I thought that just was dirt, but these shoes are starting to peel, so it's time for a new pair. I think I'm ready to move on from white. Um, I'm trying to dabble into color, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get the orange peachy shade that they have next. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> I plan on replacing my dream shoe. I do plan on replacing my dream shoe. I do plan on getting a new pair, but I also do plan on like experimenting with more shoes, trying to dabble into more dressy shoes. I'm trying to move a little more into heels and whatnot, cause I'm very much, I've always been a tomboy. I always have been a sneaker person. I don't really do like Jordans and stuff, but I always have to be comfortable. I like to be able to run and move and dance and stuff. So, I want a shoe that can keep up with that. So I, I guess my next dream shoe is to find a heel or platform shoe that can do what my sneaker does and still be comfortable. Would I say my shoe is full of swag? Honestly, yes, because I use swag unironically. One thing about me, if my outfit looks fire, I'ma tell you I'm swagging from head to toe head to toe i'm really corny i'm not gonna lie i have no shame in that like i'm funny it's what i do but like not intentionally it's just people don't take me seriously sometimes like i really do mean i have swag like i love i love the early 2000s um slang like i love the music from that time so i like using words like swag um i don't i don't know it's like drip is cool but like, I'm also concerned there might be a mess in the impending future. You know what I'm saying? I don't trust, I don't trust drip. Drip leads to water damage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you, you know, because you can't, you can't, drip, drip will only get you so far. But swag, I dropped the microphone, oh my gosh. Swag though, swag will take you places. Swag has taken me to a couple of modeling um, gigs I've been dabbling into lately. Oh, where has Swag taken me? Swag has taken me to a couple of modeling gigs. I'm not really the model type. I'm, again, a tomboy. I just, I show up, I run, I dance, but apparently I'm pretty. Um, so when I have my swag on, it's like people are like, oh, can I take a picture of you? Or, oh, could you do this with me? Could you do that with me? And like, my swag allows me to exist in these spaces and 
get to experience new things because like again modeling was not something I wanted to do when I was younger I had been told I should do it because I was skinny and I thought that was a really stupid reason so I'm not gonna model because if, if the only reason you want me is because I can't gain weight no matter how much I eat because I'm trying I don't want to do that and it's like I appreciate that the modeling world has changed to be more inclusive because it's like now I know I can model for different reasons I'm worried it's gonna fall I'm sorry <laughs> Um, I'm aware like the modeling world has like changed and I appreciate that because it's more inclusive and allows people to see that it's not limited to just people who are really, really small and sometimes don't eat because it's like beauty isn't just like size, it's your personality, it's sometimes just your facial features because some people are pretty on the outside, you know, aesthetics, aesthetics, no, no substance, just aesthetics. And, um... Beauty is like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder has always been my favorite saying since I was younger because it really is true. People focus on different things when they're looking for beauty. Some people focus on just physicality. Some people focus on a person's spirit. Some people focus on a person's drive. Some people focus on a person's money. Like people find different things attractive. It's um, very important to recognize that because it's like you could have everything someone's looking for on paper. Like you could textbook be a carbon copy of whatever their type is. But it's like you may not have that internal beauty they're looking for, whether that's someone who has substance or someone who lacks substance. How do I define beauty? I definitely define beauty by a person's personality and how they interact with others. I think it's very important to recognize that everybody is a product of their environment and how you treat others and what you put out into the world is what you receive back. If you're always trying to um, incite drama and like cause problems and incite a bad mood, then it's like, that's not, that's not cute. That's not cute. Being angry isn't cute. Nobody wants to be angry. Nobody wants to be sad. Nobody wants to be crying. To me, beauty is like people who enjoy bringing joy. Like as much as my dad's an antagonist, my dad is also like really freaking funny and um he also was a dj back in the day so he also like knows how to use music to influence somebody's mood so um it's like again master manipulator but realistically it's like beauty is happiness for me it's like i like seeing people happy i like like i'm a sucker for a big smile like gap tooth snaggle tooth whatever as long as you're happy as long as you're smiling pure joy that's beauty to me like I love people who are able to be unapologetically happy. I always want people to be happy. Like, I don't like seeing people sad. I didn't have like the happiest childhood all the time. It's like my parents did the best they could, but like, they're not cool. And it's like, I hated seeing my sisters cry. I hate seeing my brothers cry. It's like, it's not their fault. That's just like the way the cookie crumbled at the end of the day. But I love looking for like joy in the little moments because those were really important to me as a kid. I don't know how much cleaner this can get. I tried though. This is so magical. I want to do this side by side. Cause what? I'm sorry if I'm out of frame. Cool. I feel like this is as good as it's gonna get. I'm not gonna lie. As someone who does hair, is it important to create a safe space? Absolutely. Um, I learned to do hair out of necessity. I have three younger sisters. My mom worked two jobs my whole childhood, still does to this day. And she's in her 50s, so I'm trying to get her to retire as soon as possible. But we'll take it one step at a time. Just get her down to one job at least. Um, and having four girls with thick Afro textured hair, because my sisters, we all have 4B to 4C. My youngest has the thickest, coilest, coily hair. It's not rough. It's just her curls are really tight. So as soon as water hits it, no, her hair is like, her hair was chin length. As soon as water hits it, shrunk up like it looked like it was an inch long like and having a d 
detangle all of that all the time. My mom couldn't do it. So we had grown up with perms. I cut my hair three times because I don't do perms. I want a big afro. Three times, yes. So the first time I cut my hair was in um, 2013. 2012 or 2013, it was like middle school. Yeah, right before eighth grade, I cut my hair because um, I decided I wanted to go natural. I had had a perm since I was like five, maybe. Yeah. So I had reached the point where I was like, uh, uh I want an afro. It's like it was before the natural girl thingy was going on. It was just I realized that when my mom couldn't keep up with the perm, having to deal with two different textures was not cute. So I was learning to braid slowly, but I hadn't achieved cornrows yet. So I cut my hair the first time, started practicing, um, made it to high school. And we had a family reunion coming up. My mom wanted me to get my hair done. Uh, she ended up telling my stylist to perm it. So I didn't know it at the time. I had just said I wanted like a roller set. So I didn't realize what had happened because I thought it was just the roller curls at first, but wash my hair and my curls were way looser than they were. It was like I went from coils to ringlets, like three type three hair, which not a problem, just not my texture. So I let her have it for a little bit, got a little undercut just to, you know, keep her on her toes. Had a couple of designs. I did a spider web, I did a gem. Um, I did a heartbeat with a little heart line going through it. My barber was real cool. Uh, I think his name was Anthony. Amazing, amazing. Um, it was a cute little phase. And then right before graduation, right before prom night, shaved my head. Not butter bald, but I had about a centimeter left. Yeah. Amazing power move, I'm not gonna lie. I uh, came home and it just so happened that as I was walking in the door, my mom was like coming out into the hallway and we just stared at each other cause she thought I was joking when I said I was gonna um, cut it. She was like, oh, you know, just, just wait a little bit, wait till after graduation, you can cut it for the summer. You know, do, do what you did for your graduation pictures, just so you know we have something nice, something cute. And then you can cut it after. I said, mommy, I'm going to prom, but a bold. So I slicked it down with some like faux finger waves and it was a cute little moment. I rocked the short fro ever since, went through my TWA phase. I started learning the cornrow when I was in a teeny weeny afro. The twa, the twa. What? Yeah, um, I started learning the cornrow in high school. Uh, I started when I had box braids. I would um, practice the motions with that just to get my hands familiar with it. And then I started moving on to practice on my baby sister. She still had a perm at the time. So it was a softer texture hair. So I really had to learn like how to grip without pulling too hard, which I appreciate now looking back because it allows me to do my client's hair without too much tension. Um, I'm able to like grip the hair no problem because I'm used to gripping on a slippery texture that's not built for cornrows. Um, yeah, so I learned how to cornrow my uh, little sisters at first, and then I started practicing on myself as well. I think I had finally done some su successful cornrows by the time I was like 16. And then around that time is when I started like braiding my friend's hair and stuff for like marching band events because we did a uh, color guard the flags together. And so that was cool because it allowed me to like practice on somebody who wasn't my sisters because my sisters, once I did their hair, the hair was done. I couldn't do anything else about it. Like the hair's done. But um, after I uh, got to do all my friend's hair, I got to experiment with different styles um but yeah um with my friend i got to experiment with different colors different textures and different styles that like my sisters wouldn't ask for my uh 20 year old sister she's she knows what she likes and she knows what she doesn't like and so it's like she'll do like super super long hair but she sticks to like faux locks and like micro braids um she's so pretty i love her so much but braids like box braids were the thing that she always stuck with because she didn't really like corn. She's not a fan of cornrows. Um, so I didn't really get to practice straight backs on her the way I could practice with my friend because I would do the straight backs for her and she would go do her crochet, stuff like that. Um, so it was great practice for me. And then I started also like 
doing some of the guys' hair at school on occasion, not too often, because I don't like having people in my house. I don't like going to people's houses. I'm not gonna lie. So, um, the salon was cool. It was a nice upgrade because I was able to do hair. And for me, that was important because with creating the safe space to bring this all around, um, hair has always been a fight with me and my mom. I have very thick, thick textured hair. I had a perm for most of my life. Cut it three times out of spite. So I'm like, mom, I'm gonna have this fro. And I did. I was able to achieve it and it was great. I loved it. I locked up my hair because I don't have time to maintain my fro right now. But I'm going back to the fro in a couple of years. But um, hair was always a fight for me. I used to get beat. I used to get held down. It's arguments like all the time. I have thick hair. It's very soft is the thing. But the thing is they raw dog the hair. They they don't detangle it. They don't they don't use water. They just they just hack at it with a hot comb and just just they they burn the tangles out. And it just it my hair would break off. I thought my hair wasn't able to grow for a very long time. So like cutting my hair was very nice for me because it, it grew back every single time. Like I realized that it wasn't my hair that was the problem. There was nothing wrong with my jeans. It was the way my hair was being treated. It was the space that it was in. And it's like, everything when in the proper space will grow. What you nourish will grow. My hair was not being nourished. So I was able to take control of it. And then by having the salon, creating that space for other people, it's like, I have people who have come to me and they're like, I like the way my stylist does my hair, but the products they use messes up my scalp, doesn't, it, it flakes up, it makes me look a little crusty. One client told me that he tried to get his hair done twice while he was away at school. And he took them out within 48 hours because it just, it was uncomfortable. And it was, I, I told him, I'm like, you know, if you're gonna go up there, one thing you should think about is looking into the products I use, take them with you. You know, purchase them, take them with you so you have them. Hey, I need my hair done. If you do my hair, could you use this? This is what my stylist back home uses, this is what I'm used to, this is what I know will work. And it allows them to have that safe space and take it other places. So I don't like to gatekeep. Realistically, if I don't have to do it, I'm not going to. I have, I have no, because I have, I have three younger god brothers. I have one older brother. I got three younger sisters. And it's like, at different times, they all need their hair done. So it's like, and then I also am like the family stylist. So other people also come to me, hey, you know, your, your nephew who you love so much, he, he wants some cornrows and he says he doesn't like when I do it. Hey, your niece said she misses you. She said she wants a style that you did one time. Oh yes, they definitely pay me. They also feed me too. But um, it's like time I don't have to spend outside of my family. I will always appreciate it. I will always take it. I will always cherish it because I get to do my family's hair, create a safe space within my family because I know how Sarah Eunice can be when handling hair. But I also um, understand that sometimes it's not convenient for my clients to come to me. So I want them to still be able to get that same experience elsewhere. I want them to know that, hey, if you move to California, you don't have to worry because this is the gel I use. Find it. If you have to order on Amazon, you can do it. But your braider will not have you looking around with a, with a flaky scalp. It's not going to happen because you know what to use. It's, you know what to avoid. Hey, you know that you don't like, that you don't have the time to be going to the beauty supply store and pay $13 for a bottle of hair oil. You can go get some grapeseed oil or some olive oil from the grocery store for half the price and get double to triple the amount. A lot of people don't know that. And it's very important. It's like the essential oils that we have, a lot of them are herb-based or like plant-based. You can go pick up some rosemary or some peppermint from your local grocery store or your like farmer's market or wherever you get your, your organic product from. And you can just cook that with the oil, infuse it. And you have a homemade hair growth oil. Look into the properties of like each thing that you use and you can figure out what works for you. Like some people it's like, they want volume. Some people they want length. I want length. I want something that's gonna stimulate growth. I don't need more volume. My hair mad thick. My hair mad thick. It's like, you have to find what works for you. It's like, sometimes it's not that a product isn't working. It's just not designed for your desired results. What does it mean to be from Sierra Leone? 
Um, for me, it means that I have a direct connection with my culture. I know exactly where I come from, and I also know exactly why my parents are the way they are, which I think is very important. Because once you understand that sometimes it's not that your parents don't love you, it's really just a cultural difference. It, it helps. But also, I like it because the food is amazing. Um, I like that our food, it's like, it's rice, a lot of rice. We have plasas, which is um, plants mixed with, uh, well, cooked with uh, palm oil, coconut oil, um, and meat. We use cow foot, oxtail sometimes, pig foot, cow tripe. I love me some cow tripe. Um, different, different meats, chicken, smoked fish. Oh my gosh, we, we eat barracuda. We call it kuta. But we, we, uh, we do barracuda in our food, um, which is really good. It's this nice, like, fleshy fish. It's so good. But um, it also is clothing. I like the um, hand-sewn dresses and skirts that I get, the shirts, the um, head wraps, the jewelry, the, um, the language. I like that um, sometimes when me and my sister want to talk and we don't want people in our business, we can just switch to Creole. It's not a major difference from English, but it's enough to throw people off because the thing with Creole is it's not, nothing is like an exact definition. It's not like this means this. It's like my, um, my aunt's husband explained it really well. It was like, we say yeri, which means to hear, but it's like for us to hear means to listen, but it also means to understand. Like, and depending on the context, it's like you'll hear it and you won't like, like you'll, if you know what you're listening for, you'll know the context and it'll change the meaning. But if you only know it as the one word with the one definition, it's not gonna make sense. It's like a very uh, connotative language and I like it. And it's also, it sounds fun, but also I like it because it's like, being Sierra Leonean means that you recognize one, how big of a continent Africa is how diverse the countries are, and then how diverse the tribes are within that country. Because my family is Sierra Leonean, but my mom is Mende, where my dad is Shabro. So those are two different tribes. Um, Mende are more common, Shabro, um, not so much. Um, I forget the exact region, but my mom said she grew up in um, Mongare. Uh, we went to Bo. When I went to Sierra Leone earlier this year, that's where my um, grandmother grew up. Or my grandmother like raised my mom and her siblings. Um, it's the second largest city. They call it the second city. Um, and it was nice to go there because it was different. Um, going back home, you realize how, one, privileged you are to grow up in America because there's a lot of stuff that they don't have back there. Like they ration the electricity. There are some nights where one region will have power and the other one won't. And if you have enough, you can afford a generator so you don't have no power throughout the night. And it gets really hot at night sometimes. So you gotta keep the windows open, but there's mosquitoes. I, my mom, my mom hoed me on this trip. She's like, we can buy repellent when we get there. They ate me up. Those mosquitoes ate me up, oh my goodness. I got bit on the face, not once, not twice. Count it, thrice, three times, three times. And it's funny because the last two happened the day before I went back to the States. I'm like, y'all want me to go back ugly. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Y'all don't want me winning. I had my nice little, my nice little melanated tan. Uh, I had full belly of food I've been eating non-stop the whole trip. Oh my gosh, what do you want for breakfast? Rice and plasas. What do you want for lunch? Rice and plasas. What are we doing for dinner? Rice and plasas. You don't want to like go to a restaurant or something? Do they have rice and plasas? <laughs> One thing about me, if I'm eat fresh plasas, it, it hits different. Like we're able to grow some of the um, plants that we use over here. Like we use the leaves of the potato plant and the leaves of the cassava yucca plant um, in our food. And it's bomb, cassava leaf, delicious. Um, potato leaves, also delicious. Like, we're very simple people. I also like um, crane crane, which I think is made from jute leaves. Um, 
but it's like we're able to grow some of them over here but we can't they don't stay fresh all year like i can go like i was able to go back there and have crane crane which is out of season which was out of season at the time so i hadn't been able to have it for months i'm like mommy mommy you don't love me you're not making crane crane and she's like it's out of season babe i don't know what you want me to do grow it what do you mean what do you want what i want grow it does she have a green thumb absolutely not but am i gonna complain anyway absolutely it's like realistically we have aunts that um they are they do have green thumbs uh the matriarch of our family um she had a garden um so she's that one who actually talked about her cousin sadia about gardening um and um my aunt Frances, who is really close friends with my grandmother, who I'm named after. Um, that's my dad's mom, Mildred. Um, she also has a garden. She's usually the one who provides us with like peppers and like the jute leaves and stuff. And we're able to get some of them from the international market, but having it fresh from the motherland to be a little corny, it hit different. I went over a lot of topics, but at the core, being Sierra Leonean means like being able to be immersed in two different cultures at once. It's like I can recognize where our culture difference differs from black American culture. I can recognize where each side can learn from the cultures. Um, we have a different, it opens us to a different variety of music because you're able to understand more the different languages. Once you translate some of the songs, you're like, they said, what? Oh my gosh, because it's crazy sometimes. Like, some of the songs I was bumping as a child, I had no business bumping them when I learned the meaning. But it was just, I don't look at them as like, oh, that's what that song means. It's like, it's always associated with a party, a good time, like good food, uh, rejoicing. Like my favorite thing about my culture is when someone passes away, we don't, like we do the funeral for like Christian purposes. And there's a lot of Muslims as well. We have a very, like um, a lot of families will have a heavily, like equal amount of Christian and Muslim. So usually when we pray, we'll do both the Islamic prayer and the Christian prayer over the food. Um, but, Whenever we have a funeral, it's not really a funeral. We do like a celebration of life. So it's like, we're not looking at it as like, they're gone. We're like, okay, but they were here and they turned up. Not like they turned up, but like, think about all the good they did. Think about, we, they always remind us to focus on the happier parts. And it really meant a lot when I lost my grandma because we weren't able to go back home for the funeral. Um, my mom couldn't afford it at the time. Uh, I lost my grandmother to breast cancer. She was actually my first tattoo. So I got a pink ribbon and an infinity symbol with her name and her birth date, not her death date, because she lives on forever. Like, we always have the memories of her. We actually have beef with my mom because we had to throw out the, she decided to throw out the chair my grandma used to sit in all the time. Because it was, it was old and it was busted down and she wants new furniture and we get that, we get that. But it's like, that was grandma's chair. So it was like, that was a really hard thing, but it was like, at the end of the day, we knew, we, we know no matter what chair that it, what chair is, takes that space, grandma's chair was always there. That's where grandma always sat. We always have stories. Like one of my favorite stories was um, my sister, Irene, she's about to be 16. Uh, she has always been a menace from the time she learned how to walk. She learned how to walk. She was a running baby. That's, that's what they call them. It's like the toddlers that, the, the babies that once they learn how to walk, they take off like a rocket, running baby. Um, if, if she was too quiet, she was in something, she was up to something, go find her immediately. There was one day my grandma, she always drank a bottle of uh, Guinness Stout at the end of the night. Uh, she was sitting down, she had one propped next to her chair. Irene runs up, snatches it, takes a sip, puts it right back down, takes it right back off. My mom comes home, she comes, she's, she walks with my grandma, she walks with my mom, she's like, it's time for me to go. Your kids want me to go to jail. <laughs> They're trying to get me locked up. Yeah. She's still a menace to this day, but we love her. What does it mean to be a sister? To be a sister, it means that you have a built-in support system. It's, um, realistically, that's not always how life turns out. 
But at the end of the day, if you and your siblings grow up in the same household, nobody's going to understand your parental trauma the way you guys do. And it's like, you guys are not going to have the same trauma because, of course, parents don't always treat all their kids exactly the same. But there are, cer like, there are certain jokes about your parents that only you guys are going to get. Like, my fa in our household, I'll tell you that for free. That's my dad and my mom's favorite saying. My mom got it from my dad because that's my dad's favorite thing to say at the end of an argument. Whenever he makes his point, he'll be like, and I'll tell you that for free. Yeah, love my father. Um, but my mom does it too sometimes when she gets irritated with us as well. So whenever we're making fun of them, we'll be like, and I'll tell you that for free. Pointed look in their direction so they know we're making fun of them. And it's like, that's a more lighthearted thing, but it's like also, it's like we see the things that everybody else doesn't. Like sometimes a lot of people don't understand why people have like a difficult relationship with their parents. And being Sierra Leone, it's always like, well, that's your mom, that's your dad. At the end of the day, respect your mother, respect your father. And it's like, yeah, I respect them, but I don't feel like talking to them right now. And they don't get that. And it's like, to them, it's like, it doesn't matter what happened. At the end of the day, you gotta let it go, because that's your parent. But it's like, sometimes an apology is warranted. Like, unfortunately, a lot of Sierra Leonean parents don't believe in apologizing. It's like, they, they will say, the, and parents can say the most vile things to you. It gets a little worse when they're African, I'm not gonna lie. And it's like, sometimes an I'm sorry goes a long way. Like, and I didn't mean it will go a long way. But it's like, sometimes they don't wanna hear it. They don't wanna admit that they're wrong. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like, who are you as my child to come tell me I'm not doing something right? And when you have a sibling there, it's like, you can go talk to them. You can go say, hey, mom did this. Am I tripping? Dad did this. Am I tripping? Like, did I do something wrong? Or it's like, sometimes it's not even, did I do something wrong? It's like, sometimes they know. My favorite thing is my sisters, they know when they do something wrong, especially my brother. Oh my gosh, all of my siblings, I love them. They know when they're in the wrong, real sassy, all of us. They know when they're in the wrong, but they also, um, sometimes they just want to vent. They're like, okay, I may have blown it out of proportion, but I truly don't understand why they don't see my side. And it's like, you can look at the situation and be like, baby, maybe it's cause, Cause you dead wrong but like sometimes they don't want to hear that they just want to hear like hey you know how mom is hey you know how dad is and it's like also it means you have like a test run for the real world depending on how your relationship is with your siblings it's like sometimes it's like hey let's go do this thing for fun you know what i'm saying or sometimes it's like hey i'm gonna do something and if you snitch i'm gonna break your arms you know, like, some people have, the, it, it, my favorite is the, we're siblings. Of course I can donate my kidney to you, but if you use my charger, I'm going to hurt you. You know what I'm saying? We're siblings. Yes, we can go out to eat because I want to go get Chipotle and you might as well come with me. But if you eat my chicken tender that I put in the fridge three weeks ago, I don't care if it's rotting. If you touch it, we don't get to scrapping. It's on site. It's on site. You know what I'm saying? Don't take my fry. You literally have a whole plate of fries right there. Matter of fact, you have a whole plate of fries and so do I. Handful of yours. It's mine now. Boom. Mine. It's like we're siblings. No, you cannot borrow my shirt. Here, this dress doesn't fit me anymore. You can have it. I don't want it. We're sisters. It's like sometimes it's just like I like having my sisters because they have so many different personalities, but we're all like crackheads. <laughs> um, one of my favorite memories was when my brother was home from college. It was right when um, Crew by Shy Glizzy, Brent Vides, and Golden had dropped. And they have the uh, club remix, the, the little uh, kind of like go-go one. And we had that playing and it's like somebody was dancing on the dining table, somebody was dancing on a dining chair, one of the babies was on the freezer, somebody was on, everybody was cranking though, like just dancing i think it was my dad who had just woken up he just comes downstairs like he comes downstairs he's about to go into the garage to have his morning cigarette comes downstairs just looks at us for about 10 seconds we still cranking we all pointing at him singing like hey nice to meet I'm, yeah just going in bar for bar the baby should not have known the words but she did she did and he just looks at us and he's like these are really my kids you know he don't say nothing just his face is like it's pure acceptance that's his fate. And he just goes and continues into the garage. Like, 
my 20 year old sister she loves to cook that's her love language so it's like my favorite thing to do is give her like recipes to try because i'm lactose intolerant so i like finding dairy-free substitutes and being like yo you could make this because sometimes when i do favors for her she's like i'll make you something to eat that's nice um when i started driving i got my license so i could drive my sisters around um they always they were able to participate in more activities because they had me to pick them up um when my mom couldn't keep them in the car during the colder mornings because she had to go to work i could sit with them because i didn't have school or i didn't have work or anything um when they missed the bus i could take them um being a sister also means bullying absolute absolute we're, we're bullies we're bullies being a sister means like I'm gonna walk into your room and just throw something on the floor because why is your room so organized? Being a sister is, yeah, you're cute, but your forehead's big. Yeah. Yeah. Being a sister is, um, I really like the way you put your outfit together today. Too bad you built like a bean pole. Being a sister is, has your nose always looked like that? That's crazy. Couldn't be me. It don't matter if we look exactly the same. My mom's uterus really pressed a, a copy instead of print. Um, same face, just different amounts of melanin. Like, yeah, cause the, the melanin printer was like super rich when she had my brother, but it's like, they, they got us, they got us because it was like, it was one of the like the slow rise melanins it's like you gotta you gotta let it bake a little bit so he came out pink you you see you've seen my brother my brother is dark skin and beautifully beautifully chocolate i'm actually really jealous um i'm jealous of his complexion i wish i had come out just a little bit darker um because whenever whenever we put on that orange the yellow mm -hmm, a pink now don't get me wrong don't get me wrong i do not like pink in the summertime right after i've been in the beach you can catch me in some pink just that once though don't get too comfortable but i really like the way um his skin is able to go with like a lot of like bright colors i love the contrast it creates um yeah i love my siblings they're also it? dickheads though that part don't forget that part they're dickheads like we're gonna have to edit out the part where I said I love them. Not really, but yeah. What does it mean to spend a day in my shoes? As of late, my day starts with, um, I usually wake up around like seven. My internal body clock is on point because I make sure to go to bed on time. I have a bedtime. Um, I usually wake up around seven. My sister has to go to school. Her school is actually um, 10 minutes away from the salon. And currently PG County is going through a bus driver shortage. So her bus route is unreliable. So it's convenient for me to just take her to school in the morning. So first thing in the morning on a weekday, I'm taking her to school, checking my clients for the day, making sure everybody like knows what the schedule is ask my clients what style they're doing if they haven't already told me usually they'll send a picture ahead of time but if we haven't discussed that that's the time where we clarify that take her to school salon really doesn't usually no one really comes until like 10 30 11. i'm usually there by like 9 30 10 because she has to be at school it's 10 minutes away sometimes i'll grab a smoothie or something to start my day or i'll eat breakfast like when i get there um and then I'll usually wash, fold the towels if we have any like laundry left over, make sure the combs are clean and sanitized, organize that, get everything kind of set up for the day, turn the lights on, get the music going, figure out the vibe. I'm usually an R&B girly, I'm not gonna lie. I like to keep things smooth and relaxed. I like me a good little poem, some, some lyricism, a little, little crooning, you know what I'm saying? Something soft. I also love me a good, uh, I like someone who's who's vocally talented. I like someone who has a good range. So, yes, yes. I think I think it's about as good as it's gonna get. I'm happy with this. These no longer look like I have like run through a baseball field. Yeah. 
But yeah, usually I'll get the lights turned on, set the music, pick the vibe. Cousin shows up, boss shows up for the day. We get to we get to cracking clients out. Locks, braids, twists, whatever the day is for it. Usually I'm doing cornrows or braids or locks. I don't usually do extensions too often just because they last so long. It's like people come to for those every like two to three months. Um Depending on what time I finish, I'll either take a lunch break if it's a long day or head home if it's a short day, go hang out with some friends, go home and like watch some anime maybe. Definitely eat, I eat a lot. I should mention I try to eat like six times a day. Three. This is a day in my shoes.